My name is Mark Koenix and uh, this is Team 5. Uh, for Team 5, I uh, did the supervisory portion. I'm Daniel Hartzog. Uh, I did the control systems portion. My name is Steve and I did the sensors portion. All right. uh, my name is Andrew Van Check, um, and we're Team 12. Um, my role was the sensor pick. I'm Christina Wise and I was the motors controls. I'm John the Grub. My role was the control systems. And we were combined together to form Team Frankenstein. So the basic purpose of the supervisory system uh, is to provide a way for the rover to tell the user what's going on and uh, for the user to tell the rover what to do next. Um, so the system basically receives uh, a pretty consistent stream of status messages from the rover, um, processes them, uh, and displays them on the screen. Um, certain messages uh, will change the state of the system, uh, and depending on the state of the system, the user can select items from a menu um, to issue commands to the rover. Um, so the basic interface looks roughly like this. So there is a grid, and then a menu, uh, and then a graph of the sensor output from the rover. So in software, this is implemented as a series of tasks. Um, at the bottom level, there's uh, I squared C communication. Um, so basically, the uh, the ARM microcontroller board that runs that is communicating with a uh, PIC microcontroller that's running a wireless communication module, um, and uh, it sends status messages up to the use, to the user interface task. Um, user interface task sends screen updates up to the LCD task. Um, which ultimately drives the display panel on the board. Um, the UI task sends commands back down to the I2C communication task where they're sent back to the rover. Um, there's a timer task that runs uh, and pull, er, uh, basically keeps the I2C communication task alive and keeps it checking for new messages from the rover. Yeah! We are the control pick. Um, <laughs> so. <laughs> Our pick has a timer task where it would go off and pull the sensors and the motors for both sensor data and encoder data from the shaft encoders, uh, which would help us determine where exactly the rover would be in the course. Uh, we designed the I2C communication, the master communication for the motor and sensor slave picks. Um, it's basic uh, master I2C, you can look it up. So, once the data is received, it's sent from the I2C task to message distribution to the control task. The control task is based on a state machine depending on the grid. So, when the rover starts, depending on the row it's in, it has an expected distance that it needs to be from the wall. If it's at the correct distance, it will continue to go straight. And if it's not, it will calculate the difference and make adjustments. Once it reaches the end of the row, when it no longer has sensor data, it will do a hard-coded turn to enter the next row, readjusting upon entering, do that row, and repeat for the last one. As it goes through, it uses the shaft encoder data to keep track of how far it's gone, and records where all the ramps and empty spaces in the grid are. As it's going about the course, it keeps track of all these statuses of it and sends it across Wi-Fi to the supervisory system. It sends all of the sensor data, the motor data, uh, the current state, as in like, you know, which row you are, uh, how the grid is filled out so far, and its intention, as in 
the next command that it's going to be sending to the motor system. In addition to sending the status messages, it receives heartbeats on a regular interval from the supervisory system. If it stops receiving these heartbeats, then it knows that it's been disconnected and it will stop. So in terms of the sensors portion, one of the design approaches uh, we decided to take is, uh, is first use the IR sensors. So what I chose to, to try use for this design project is uh, use two medium IR sensors and, have, and use two small IR sensors. Uh, medium IR sensors are able to uh, cover uh, 10 to 80 centimeters as for the small IR sensors. They're able to cover four to 30 centimeters. Um, so the way to uh, the two medium sensors would, would work is that uh, they would be mounting on the same side of the rover just so that it would be able to detect this wall. Um, as this rover like traverses through this first lane, uh, it would only be able to detect uh, this wall and uh, as it turns around, because it, it, it's able to cover 80 centimeters distance, it would then be able to read through this wall. But when it gets to the third lane, that's when the small IR sensors come into use, just so they can cover to, the, to this wall, just so that that way, like the, the rover will be able to uh, traverse through just straight forward and make sure it's like it's not getting tilted. Uh, it would generally be time driven, uh, and when in each certain time, it's going to be using the read ADC function, which is going to trigger the ADC interrupt handler, and then every certain time, it's going to pick up some sensor data, and whenever an I squared C master is going to like is requesting it, I mean, it's going to then be checking through the message queue and whatever is stored into the message queue is, going to, is just basically uh, pull out whatever is the, like, the most recently updated and just have it uh, reply to the, to just through I2C communication uh, and have it sent to, to the master pick. For my sensor design, um, I used four sonar sensors and mounted, on, mounted them on the rover, two facing left and two facing right. Um, the two facing left are on the right side of the rover due to a minimum distance that they could read of 20 centimeters to make sure that they're always at least 20 centimeters from the wall and vice versa for the left side. Um, they're staggered vertically in order to get a straight line of sight to the wall as well. Um, these sensors worked over I squared C as slave devices my sensor pick and um, the way they worked was first sending a write to the address of the sensor and from there um, the sensor performed a reading which took about a hundred milliseconds so in order to sample all four sensors it took at least 400 milliseconds minimum from there when you got the data on the timer queue the, the values were saved into a message queue, and upon request from the control system, it responded with the data in a report. For ramp detection, we used tilt switches, two of them, one mounted on the front and one mounted on the back. These are triggered after going over a certain angle in order to detect if we're going up a ramp and down. I was in charge of the motors role for our team, and how the motors are controlled. Basically, the supervisory sends a signal via Wi-Fi to the control pick that it's ready to, in what direction to move. Um, the control pick then sends via I squared C a command to the motor pick, which determines the state of the rover, meaning which signal should be sent through the UART to the saber tooth, which controls the actual motors. The motor's pick itself only sends the two bytes of data, which control the left and the right, um, through uh, UART. And then the motor's pick receives, via the timer interrupts, encoder data, which is basically just a uh, one or a zero, depending on how many, if the motor encoder is clicked, meaning it's moving forward. The, it's hooked up to the timer interrupts one and t uh, zero and one as an external external clock, meaning every time it's triggered, um, every time the encoders are triggered, the uh, number that's in the timer register increases. And when that overflows, it means we have gone one centimeter. Every time the interrupt is triggered, 
the full buffer minus the number of clicks per centimeter is reloaded into that register. So the in order to in order to overflow the timer uh, the timer register just needs to go with the number of clicks per centimeter. Every time this interrupt is triggered, it also increases a, a centimeter count variable, which would let us know how far the rover has gone. Our plan was originally to have the control pick send the number of centimeters as well as the direction, which the motor pick would until the motor pick would execute this command until the number of centimeters in the centimeter count matched what the control pick had sent. All right. So because the rover uh, wasn't autonomous, um, what we did is uh, we implemented uh, kind of a remote control system into the uh, supervisory system. So uh, we have this joystick down here, um, which is usually used to select menu items um, on the supervisory system. Um, but by pushing this button here, we can switch modes uh, into one where we can issue some commands manually, and then into one where we just drive the rover directly with the joystick. So uh, you can see if I push up on the joystick, the rover moves forward a little bit, um, and I can turn the rover around, and so on and as soon as I release the joystick back into the center position the rover stops moving. Um, so this is uh, a pretty responsive um, remote control system that lets me drive the rover around the course. So in the end um, I was able to get the four sensors working okay and sampling giving accurate data. However after unplugging it from the laptop we had some issues. After that the I squared C communication kind of broke. So I, we think that might have been a power issue of some sort, but we never really got to the bottom of it. So unfortunately, we were not able to implement the shaft encoders fully and drive by sending a distance. This ended up working out since we didn't have a fully working sensor system and chose to use the joystick. So we didn't end up needing the encoder values, but it would have been nice to know how far into the ramp we were going for when we detected the uh, ramps. But if we had more time, we would have implemented a uh, state machine to determine when we were on top of a ramp. And then from this state, once we were on the ramp, we would have sent a message to the supervisory system to display, we're on a ramp. So basically we had the two tilt switches, one on the front and one on the back. And we would start in the on the ground state, meet on the ground state, meaning both the front and back sensors were just displaying, were just a one. And then once that transition was made from the back sensor going down to zero, we would know that we were going up a ramp. And then once it goes back to one, we would be on top of the ramp, and that's when we would send the message. Once we started going back down the ramp, meaning the front, the front tilt switch is triggered. Um, we would know we were going down the ramp, and then once it was back to one and one, we would be on the ground and the message would go away. Unfortunately, we didn't have enough time to implement this, but... This group is a good example of Brooks Law, where adding more team members to an already late project will make the project even later. Uh, both Team 5 and 12 has lost a team member. Uh, we had two weeks to merge our material, material to try and uh, meet requirements for the project. Unfortunately, adding more members to a project that's already late drove us to an incomplete submission by the deadline. We done, let's go home. <laughs>